Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Raj. Today we'll be talking about putting a critical issue on the spotlight. A critical issue being sickle cell anemia. My guest today, Tony Adewemi, will be telling us about why she decided to take that big risk. When you talk to so many people about the illness sickle cell, they always assume that they won't get the publicity it deserves. There's no need for putting it out for sure because no one will watch it. She decided to take on that risk. Who is Tony? She was a former human resources manager that went on to pursue her journey as a film producer. We'll be talking to her about her journey and how she got there. But most importantly, about her movie, Strength. I won't give you much out, I won't give away too much, but let me tell you, take a minute to watch the shot clip of Strength. And then, at the end of the movie, meet my guest, Tony Adewomi, as she shares her journey in getting this movie into Netflix and making it a well-known movie and putting a spotlight on a critical issue affecting so many around the world. Meet Tony Adewomi. Kids and I, we had a great time. I mean, I could have sworn that they liked my painting and they were going to put it up for display. Do you want to follow me the way you're looking at him? Hi, my name is... Hey, where is Eji? You have an emergency. Come out. No, sister, please come to the courtyard. For a child to have the sickle cell disease, both parents should have one S gene. When will all of this be over? When will we get our lives back? I can't seem to say anything right these days. Of course you can. After all, you're the one providing for all of us in this house. Your father has decided to let bygones be bygones. Mommy, I should be the one letting bygones be bygones. Sumto worries that his best friend will die. And that is not the right situation for a child. Things will change a lot for your family, especially for Ekene. I don't want to lose my son. <laughs> If you lose hope, your family will lose hope. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal Conversation again with myself and Welsh. Um, most of you must have seen the movie because I did ask you to go see it, Strain. I'll be talking to one of the producers. I think she is actually the major producer who produced this movie. And she took a risk because you know, sickle cell is a genetic blood disorder that affects many, many Africans. But it's now diverse. I have myself as sickle cell and I've now seen the coverage is starting to get. And she took this big risk to do this for us. Her name is Tony. And she'll be telling us about her own journey, why she decided to take this risk on shining a spotlight on a critical issue, sickle cell anemia. Tony, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Thank you, Han, for having me. I'm doing well today. Uh, I'm right here in Lagos, Nigeria, and it's a beautiful um, day today. Again, thank you for having me. Oh, it's nice. It's always nice when I talk to someone and they say it's a beautiful day where they are. Today in London, it is also a beautiful day, so we can't complain. We're just going to be, you know, when it's nice, when it's not rainy, when it's not too cold, we accept it. Mm -hmm. You were a tremendously amazing person because you saw a gap in the market and a critical subject, sickle cell anemia. Right. I, you didn't shy away from it. You didn't say, oh, this is not going to give me money. This is not going to do the job I wanted to do. But you decided. Right take a risk. We're not going to go into that right now because I want to understand you. If I ask, who are you? <laughs> okay, right. Um, so like you already said, I'm um, Uluwatoi Adewumi. Uh, you know, I'm called Toi for short. Everyone calls me Toi. Um, I'm Nigerian, born in Nigeria and raised, raised in Nigeria. Um, I'm the first girl of a family of five children. 
So I have three um, older brothers and then I have a younger sister. Um, like I said, well, grew up in Lagos, part of Nigeria. So Lagos is um, the biggest city in, in Nigeria and I would say Africa, actually. So I was born in Lagos and, and I grew up in Lagos. Uh, I trained um, in school as a... Uh, my, 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 my background is in estate management. I think it's called property management uh, out there in the UK. Yes. Um, but then I, from there, went on um, and I crossed into human resource management. And so all my work career has been in human resource management. Um, and I've been doing that now since um, 2006. So in the last, um, I think, 15 years, I've been practicing as a human resource management person. Um, first, I worked in a multinational for a while, a multinational company for a while, and then I started my own uh, human resource consulting firm, which is what I do now. Um, and then um, in 2017, um, I got fascinated about um, filmmaking. Um, and it started first for me, so when I stopped paid employment, um, I, I started the HR consulting business and I realized, you know, I sort of had more time on my hands than the open about, you know, getting extra source of income, not relying on one source of income. So I thought, okay, what else can I do with myself? And I just, you know, had some sort of um, soul searching and realized that I was interested in filmmaking and all that goes on behind the scene. And so I, you know, pushed myself into filmmaking and that's, you know, how I started that part of my life as well. And so today I do both human resource management and filmmaking. I'm married and I have two beautiful children, um, a girl and a boy. Wow. Yeah, so that's that's like toying in the summary. <laughs> oh, toying. Um, human resource management is something um, that requires a lot of human skills. I said people hear human resource management, but they don't really, don't really understand that. It's not just you saying you're doing human resource, but because it requires a lot of human resource. What was it like when you started that role as so a human resource manager? So like I said, um that graduates have to do in Nigeria. I did that, you know, and finished that in 2005. And then um, somewhere 2006, I saw this advert for graduate management uh, training program in a multinational company. And then I applied for that and got the job. And um, I was placed in human resource department. At this time, I wasn't looking to have a career in human resources. I knew little or nothing about human resources. But as a graduate trainee, I was uh, placed in the human resource department, and that was where my, you know, human resource journey started. And when I started it, I just found it really fascinating um, working with people, you know, sort of helping people through their career journeys, recruiting people, you know, training and all of that. And it's so amazing that till today, I randomly would just get somebody call me up and say, oh, you can remember me, but back in 2008, you interviewed me for a job at the company. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, I, I've met a lot of people, so I can't remember everybody. And um, when I started HR, it then it, it dawned on me that I needed to develop myself in that area. And so I went on to do the certification in human resource management, also here in Nigeria. So I got, I got certified as an HR person. And then I thought, okay, there's still more that I can do. And so I went on again to get a master's in human resource management from the University of Liverpool, um, right out there, you know, and it's been amazing. I think the biggest thing for me is when I randomly meet people and they tell me, um, oh, you know, we worked together at the company 10 years ago. And I remember you gave me this advice as an HR person and, you know, I've, I've used it in my career. It's just so rewarding just knowing that, you know, I'm there doing my job, but then I'm adding this much value to people. You know, and it's, it's, been, it's been really rewarding. And I'm glad that um, the organization at the time decided to you know put me into the hr uh, stream when i started the graduate program well, that's uh, that's always uh, excites me because you learn so much but you know when you decided to explore this part of film and tv producing i mean this is such a different niche 
from human resource area. How did you mm -hmm. start your journey? What led you in this path to film and TV? I know you said some things about it slightly, but what truly led you on this path? So like I said earlier, right, when I was thinking about what else I could do with myself, uh, more from a having an alternative source of income. So I just sort of narrowed down what are the things I like to do? What are the things I enjoy to do? And filmmaking, you know, made that list. And I'm like, oh yeah, there's actually something about me and watching film. So um, I call it predictive power. So I'm watching a film and I'm writing the story in my head. You know, and I'm already writing the story to say, well, I'm sure this would happen next. So if I was a writer, I would do this next, I would do this next. And it turns out that half, more than half the time, I'm usually sort of right. So I said, okay, maybe there's something here to pursue. And um, I put in, I just put some funds together. It wasn't a lot of money. I uh, put some funds together in 2017. And I said, okay, I'm starting this afresh. Um, but nobody knows me in the industry. So I can't just walk up to anybody to say, give me this opportunity. So I said, okay, I'll create the opportunity for myself. And so um, I told my spouse, I said, you know, can I take this little sum from the family's purse, from the family's resource? I want to try my hands on this. And he said, okay, by all means, you know, go for it. So I took that little fund from our personal savings, um, reached out to a few people, and that's how I made my first movie back in 2017 and then we made this movie and we were able to get um, one of the big um network to to buy to license the contents of us and i think that gave me the first spring because it was really encouraging that we made that first content and we were in stock with it because a lot of filmmakers make films and um they don't get distribution for it. They don't get you know, any network that shows interest in it. And then they're, they're stuck with the product and the money that is now being tied down into the product. Um, but it was really encouraging that we had that first content and we immediately got a network that you know, licensed it from us. And you know, so that gave me the first spring. I'm like, oh, I can really do this. you know. And you know, there's been no going back since then. Yeah, and, and then 2018, you produced this um, this movie, um, Berain Daya, a 27 episode native Hausa language. Is Hausa language your uh, original language? Why? No, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do something with Hausa language? Because everyone's like, you don't know, Nigeria has many, many languages, and um, the, the three main ones are Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa. And if you're not, if you don't speak the language, I was wondering when I saw how's the language TV series which aired on multiple TV network. What was the challenge? If you don't speak the language, um, I don't know if you speak Hausa. I don't know. I so don't. How did you do it? And what was the? Did you find any challenging? Because you were successful in 2018 with this um, short series you produced. Yeah. Um. So um. I'm from, like you said, there are three you know, main languages. Um, I'm from the Yoruba speaking part. So I speak the Yoruba language. Um, the Alsa language, I probably can pick maybe five words and that's it. I can't have a conversation in Alsa language. But um, this series you talked about, Burin Dunia, is the first project that I just referred to that I did to test the waters in film production. And um, I got introduced to you know, this person who does you know filmmaking and I said you know I'm just coming into the industry I'm going to try my hands at something what can I do and she said to me well at the moment there's a huge um, request for Alsa content and so she said to me if we produce a content in Alsa language I can guarantee you that we will be able to get um, network stations to license it from us that I can guarantee and I thought, okay, well, I need that to do something that I'm sure I wouldn't be stuck with. This was my debut into the industry. It had to be successful to encourage me to keep going, right? And that's how we started. Like I said, I probably can only speak, maybe say five words in also language. And so we packed our bags and off we went to the Northern parts of Nigeria where you know outside the predominant language there because we had to shoot the series in that part of Nigeria so off we went packed our bags and we went off to Kaduna where we shot the series 
Um, I had a vacation scheduled at that time, so I couldn't stay with the team all through, but I think I was there with them for about four or five days just to see them settle down and see how things are going. And then I left the set and I was just monitoring what was going on on the phone. Um, and you know that was that was how I actually got into the industry. And indeed, we ended up um, licensing it to you know one of the biggest um, metro stations. Um, it was licensed to them for about two years. And so you know, just putting on the TV and seeing my content on the screen and seeing my name come up, it was really rewarding. It was really encouraging. And um, I think that gave me the push to keep going and then we have the second project afterwards and the second project was ch um charmed isn't it um yes and 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 that is if so was it from the success of the first one that led to the success um, the sec um, second project or how did you come about getting the second project so again it was the first one the Korean junior was first also language also it was a tv series mm. so i said okay i've done this i have some experience of how this works I want to do something else, which is now a feature film. So I said, okay, let's try a feature film. Let's see how this works. I also wanted to get an idea of how the cinema part of filmmaking works as well. How do you get a movie into the cinema? How do you make money you know, from the cinema distribution? That was also important. Um, so again, I went back to my spouse and I said, you know, Boring Junior was quite successful. The money I took out of the course, I made it back and I put it back into the course. So can I get more money this time? But you know, the budget is slightly bigger now, so I need more money. Um, and so he said, okay, I mean, you did well the first time, so I'll trust you again the second time. And so I just started speaking to different people. I want to do a feature. Do you know anybody that has a story that is quite good that we can tell? And then we said, okay, let's let's try something um, romantic comedy, you know, genre. So um, this young lady then came up to say, well, I have the story idea. I can write into a script for you. I said, okay, let's see how that goes. And you know, she came up with a charm story, and um, we produced it. The experience was definitely very different from a TV series. Um, of course, it was more money going down. Um, the actors were different because we shot it in Lagos. The experience shooting in Lagos is very different from shooting in Kaduna. So it was a new learning experience for me as well. Um, unfortunately, Charmed wasn't as successful as um, I thought it would be. Um, we had one or two festival selections, which was good. Um, we also got it on um, TV station. So um, okay, let me backtrack a bit. Um, the cinema side of it wasn't as successful as we thought, uh, but we you know just used it as a learning opportunity and learned a lot about you know, how to get movies distributed. It wasn't as successful in cinemas, but we ended up getting it on TV station eventually. So we had a TV station also license it, which was good. Um, but because we didn't make enough money from the cinema, we didn't quite break even on the project. Um, so I, for me, it was just a, I wanted to learn and, you know, I've learned. I got my fingers burnt, but it's okay, I've learned. And then one of the things that hit me after we did Champ was that beyond my innate talent or my innate knowledge and interest in filmmaking, I needed to have some sort of formal learning or formal training mm. in filmmaking. And so um, at the tail end of 2018, I then applied to the New York Film Academy, um, got the admission, and then by January 2019, my bags were packed and off I went to um, Los Angeles to, to uh, do a short course in, in film producing. I like what you just said there, is that you knew you were very good at what you did, you know, you learned lots of lessons from Cham from the first one you did, but you didn't stop there because you've realized that there were probably still a gap, there's something you needed to up your skill a lot, and I think it's something I notice a lot of people are shy about upping them skills and investing in themselves, because this you go out there, came, you came back to Nigeria and you came back with new ideas, and this is where in 2020 right big movie was made, the big idea. Can you tell me about Strain? How did this come to you? 
Why did you think Sickle Cell, that you wanted to showcase Sickle Cell and how did it get on Netflix? Okay, all right then. Um, so, um, so like I said, Chambers was, re was released in 2018, um, I think about November. So by December, we sort of, you know, did some reconciliations. What did we learn? What were the new things? And I just realized I needed to, you know, go to school. That was clear. Um, but before then, the sickle cell idea came up. And how the idea came up was um, there's been stories of people who did a genotype test at some point in life. And then many years after, realized that the test results was wrong. Mm. And it was a reoccurring incidence of multiple people that had heard of such stories of how at some point they thought their genotype was AA. And then many years down the line, they did another test and it was suddenly AS. Some of them have then ended up marrying um, partners who are AS. And as a result of that, I've then had sickle cell children with sickle cell disease. Some of them have also married partners who are AA and you know didn't have sickle cell disease. And, and then it just hits me that there's indeed a story to tell that there's some awareness that has to be created. Um, and so we got a writer who then started to write the story. As a matter of fact, we started writing Strain even before Champ was released. So it was almost like an overlap because it was, it was a born in, it was a story that was born in, you know, in my heart, I, I needed to get it out. But then there was another challenge of, oh, but this is not a, this is not a popular topic. Why would people want to sit down and, you know, watch about sickle cell? What's, what's that? I said, well, this is something I have to tell. We had to look for a way to tell the story in an entertaining way that would make people want to watch it. Mm. So we started writing the story. Um, and then I said, well, if we're writing about sickle cell, we definitely have to do enough research because it would be a shame that we tell story about real people and then these real people watch the movie and pick holes in our story. That would just be a shame if we don't portray the experiences of people that either live with a sickle cell or have family members who have a sickle cell disease. It would, it would be such a shame if we don't tell the right stories. So the research started, a lot of research online. And then we're like, okay, why are we just relying on what is online? There's a sickle cell foundation in Nigeria, right in the city of Lagos, where we live. And um, we sent them an email introducing ourselves to them and what we were doing. And you know, as God would have it, the, the reception we got from them is amazing. The national director in particular took special interest in the STREN project. And she gave us all the supports we needed. Um, I remember, and I say this, we say this a lot and we we'll laugh, right? The first version of the script that we gave to her, when she read it, she made so much notes. She printed it out and made so much notes on it. You know how a subordinate maybe does a, a mail for the boss and then you're underlining, underlining with different colors of the pen to say, no, this doesn't apply. This is wrong information. This is not medically correct. This, you know, this doesn't, a lot of corrections that she made. And then we have this meeting with her where she broke it down for us and told us a lot of things, how it happens, you know, and all of that. It was, it was mind boggling, it was high opening. So we have the script ready, mm -hmm. December, 2018. At this time, I think we were already on the, maybe fifth version of the script because we had to keep rewriting and rewriting. And so by December, 2018, we were on, we were on version five of the script. So in January 2019, I packed my bags and then off I went to LA um, to attend film school. And so I took a course in writing in film school, even though my major was in producing, but I took you know, a, short, a course in writing. And I took another look at the script. I haven't gone through the classes. I'm like, no, there's no way we're telling this story the way it is. Before I left Nigeria, I signed off on the script. I told the writer, that we were good to go, attempting for his job. And I said, you know, we're fine. Our script is ready. When I'm back from school, we'll just raise funds and make this movie. 
But my eyes opened in film school. I, I saw things from a different perspective. And so I remember that even before I came back home, I sent him an email, the writer now, I sent him an email and I said, I know I signed off on this script, but now I have new understanding of filmmaking or script writing. And I think certain things need to change. Initially, he wasn't very happy about it. I mean, this was me, um, new in the industry, just going to film school, and I'm here critiquing what is written as a writer to say changes had to be made. But he eventually came around and um, we made all the changes. Um, but before he came around, uh, I had to start doing some of the writing myself, which is why I also have um, credit as a writer in the story, because you know, initially I'd said, um, it wasn't going to write the script. So I had to start writing some part of it, but then he came around and then he ended up writing the rest of it. And that's how, you know, we had the final script and then the funding started, started reaching out to people. We didn't get enough funds. Um, this time around, I didn't want to go back into the family post. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was a wise business decision to make, to keep taking from the savings of the family. So I ended up taking a loan. I ended up taking a loan to make up what was missing. So we got some sponsorship here and there, but it wasn't enough. So I had to take a loan to make up the balance. Um, why did I think this story was important? I just felt um, having more people with the sickle cell disease is, is really avoidable. I just thought we could reduce the numbers especially having heard that in Nigeria, um, about 70% or so you know, of people born usually have uh, the sickle cell trait. So I thought we could do something about it. Um, and I know that the foundations and multiple clubs in Nigeria that are um, like sickle cell in, um, awareness clubs, they do a lot of sensitization, going to schools. But I thought, okay, people watch movies. So let's use the movie to tell the story as well, to create this awareness. There was also the bit about stigmatization as well of people not understanding what the sickle cell disease is and how they stigmatize um, people living with sickle cell and their family members. So there was a lot to tell. Um, so I was convinced that um, we had to tell that story. But I was also particular about, even if we don't make profit from it, it wasn't about the profit, it was about telling the story, which was why we had really reached out trying to get grants and um, sponsors for it instead of self-financing so that we don't have to bother about making you know, profit back. But when all of that didn't come through enough, I had to then stick out my neck to get a loan to uh, produce strength. And so we, we, we finished, um, production um, early last year mm -hmm. and we were contemplating um, going into the cinemas later in the year so the plan was okay let's try and answer some, some film festivals let's submit to film festivals do a bit of festival runs first and then later in the year we can then explore cinemas again and see what it would look like this time around and then COVID happened we couldn't go to the cinemas wow. everywhere was shut wow so we said, okay, now that we can do the cinemas because everywhere is shut, what else can we do? And Netflix, you know, came up as an idea. So we said, okay, let's explore Netflix. Um, and so we, you know, went online and we're just looking out for Netflix aggregators because again, Netflix would not, you know, do business with us directly. So we were looking for um, aggregators online. Um, we found this company first in the U.S. They are also based in L.A., not so far from, you know, the school I attended. And we started speaking to them. But at some point, um, with some background check and all of that, we realized that they weren't legit. So we... Oh, wow. Yeah, they weren't legit. Uh, we were almost at the point of signing the contracts with them. And then we just did a final background check and realized they weren't legit. So we, you know, took off and just stopped communicating with them. And then, um, so part of what happened last year during the lockdown, there were a lot of Zoom sessions. There were a lot of Zoom trainings, Zoom meetings. And so I randomly attended one of these Zoom sessions. And um, that's where we found the distributor that we eventually worked with to get 
um, strain on Netflix. It was just one of those sessions for filmmakers and I'd randomly attended and you know, one of the speakers had then introduced himself as uh, an executive from a certain um, distribution company based in South Africa. And that also, you know, talks about their, their profile and said, you know, they are Netflix aggregators. And then the light bulb just went off in my head, like Netflix, you know, this is what I've been looking for. <laughs> so after the session, uh, I dropped him an email and said, you know, I have this movie. I'm hoping we can get it on Netflix. I sent him um, the trailer and the screener for the movie. And um, when he watched the trailer, you know, he responded back to say, well, I like the quality of the movie. I like the acting, uh, but I'm not sure about the genre. You know, it's not comedy. It's not romance. You know, I'm not sure if Netflix would want to take this on board. Uh, but then he said, but I would share this with um, our head of sales and um, let's see what he says. So fingers crossed. And then a few weeks after, I got the email from the head of sales saying, oh, Toyin, wow, I just watched Strain. I was very emotional. I'm a father myself. And I just kept thinking about, you know, what if this was my child? And then he went on and on and on. You know, I really love this movie. I'm going to push this to Netflix. And then I scrammed, screamed and said, oh, you know, thank you. This is, you know, exactly what we're looking for. And that's how, you know, the Netflix journey started, you know, making the offer and all of that. And you know, today, you know, here we are. Wow, Tony, this is an amazing story. You didn't give up on us. You didn't give up on people who said us so. You were determined to make us, you know, make a movie that really, and you know, when you watch it, I'm as a sickle cell sufferer myself, I was a bit nervous to watch it because one thing I don't like to watch too much pain or this, because it also makes me feel like I'm going to have my own sickle cell crisis. And I watched this thing. I didn't just see the pain. I also saw a family and I understood myself as a sickle cell person, what other people go through, what your carers, your mother, your family, your father, your sisters, mm -hmm. your brothers, your mm -hmm. husband, your children go through because you have this illness and how it changes dynamics of things. And this for me was what sold it to me. And the fact that you also bring joy in this movie, you don't make a movie that where at the end of it, there's such tragedy, yeah. you bring yeah. joy. There's this pain, but at the same time, there's lots of joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you laugh, you see the sibling rival, sibling relationship and how they had to overcome their challenges to come together as a family to mm -hmm. solve, you know, you, your brother or your sibling. Because I know myself when I was growing up, I was always challenging my sisters were not quite sure. Do I support Anne? Do I not support Anne? And, uh, yeah, but they did. They did. Eventually they did. And they did it with love because of eventually it always comes through. And mm -hmm. I, this is why I... I had to speak to you about this movie because it's not just a movie, it's a deep movie that tells a fantastic story that anybody who has seen strength will not just understand the issue of sickle cell, but the issue of chronic illness on how it can damage yeah. a family. It can just yeah. damage a family. So it's up to your family to decide what side of the room they want to stay. So and yeah. stand up. Thank you for that. So thank you. Yeah. So uh, when it's on Netflix, when, when you realize it was the Netflix and it started to, um, you know, it, 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 it brought awareness, how, how has it been received since, since the movie has been out on Netflix? I think it came out this year. So it's been out yeah. the movie. in May. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been amazing. I think first is it also, so when we started, when we started the project, we knew that it wasn't a Nigerian story. Um, we knew that it was a universal story because again, like you rightly said, it wasn't just about sickle cell in isolation. It was about family. It was about sacrifice. It was about love. It was about dealing with um, issues in the family. It was also about hope. And we knew from the onset that these are themes that cuts across the universe, irrespective of your skin color, irrespective of where you're from. But we didn't expect the level of um, attention that it got globally. Um, when, when Strain released on Netflix, even before it released, um, just the build up to the release, we were getting DMs from everywhere. You know, DMs are, are, are 
especially on Instagram, our DMs were full from everywhere. People were reaching out to anybody they could get on the project, the actors, the director, the producers, the official train um, angel as well. People were reaching out and were just saying, thank you, thank you. Finally, somebody is telling our story. Thank you, you know, it was, and for us, it was, oh, wow, this is bigger than we imagined. Um, this is, you know, the impact is bigger, better than we ever imagined. Um, just last month on the, on the sickle cell um, day in June. June 19th. Yes, June 19th, we were on a Zoom call with a team from um, Trinidad and Tobago. They had invited us to come spend the day with them on Zoom just to talk about strain just to talk about the sickle cell. They had it as part of their annual program for the year. That was amazing. We were, we were on the phone for I think three hours, wow. just gisting and just having people share their stories and have caretakers come on and just share how the journey has been for them taking care of a child, living with the sickle cell. But people who are also living with sickle cell just come and share their story. And it was in fact, when we got the invitation from them, I'm like, wow, all the way from Trinidad and Tobago, how? Like, we're just here in Nigeria, just, you know, minding our business. And again, it was this same thing of thank you for telling this story that people have shied away from all this while. Thank you for not just telling the story, but telling it in an authentic way. Um, thank you for the facts that you put in, like it was very relatable and you know, I have people tell us in that session, people were referring to actual scenes in the movie and would say to me, when we got to the scene where the boy walked, snake snuck um, by his father to go downstairs to get his medication, when I watched that scene, I saw myself because I used to do that a lot as a child because I didn't want to burden people. So when the crisis would start, I would try to be strong and try to get my medication myself. So when I was watching that, I saw myself in it. Okay. You yeah. know, and different things, sorry? A lot of that. I saw myself in so many of the different scenes. Mine was more the sibling yeah. and <laughs> sibling and human yeah. sister. I saw exactly. myself yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we have people talk about the sibling one as well. Like, you know, just seeing the dynamic between the brother and the sister, I saw that in myself. Or seeing the dynamic even between the parents, I saw that happening in my family. I saw that in my own, you know, and I'm, I'm lost for words, to be honest, because like I keep saying, when we started this project, for us, it was just, oh, there's a story here that needs to be told. Let's create awareness. And then when we reached out to the foundation in Nigeria and they told us they were working on starting the stem cell transplantation locally in Nigeria, that was something in the pipeline. We thought, okay, let's put that in the story as well. You know, and then just last month, the 1st of July, that process has officially started in Nigeria. Wow. So now, you know, people can, you know, walk into the foundation make inquiries about the stem cell transplantation and also possibly get the procedure as well. And just also seeing how that has stemmed from the story we told and then the global recognition we're getting. I mean, look at me talking to you today, a couple of weeks before now, you didn't even know there's a toy in Adi Rumi existing anywhere in Nigeria. I didn't know about you as well, but you know, see us today having this conversation all stemming from the fact that we took the risk um, to tell the story. Wow, this is honestly it, it, it can't be it can't be said anymore. I can't give you any credit because you have done more than we expected. Anyone who watches it, my mom particularly watched it and she was so she was so she cried. You know, she just couldn't believe mm -hmm. that oh my that someone shined a light on sickle cell. Because every time we talk about sickle cell, it's almost like people don't want to know about it. They always keep themselves mm -hmm. away from it. Mm -hmm. My final question would be what message of hope? would you give to anyone who is so nervous about doing what they truly believe in? Because this was you taking a gamble. You didn't have to do this. Sickle cell is not, every time I talk to anyone about sickle cell, they say it's not an interesting topic. 
for you to hear it. Yeah. What message of hope, my final question, would you give to someone about believing in themselves and take that risk? Um, so I think one of the tenets of how I personally live life is that um, we're not here to just occupy space. You know, we're here for impact. I think that for me is something really big. We're here for impact. And so um, I think what I would say to other people, which is what I also tell myself is, are we making any impact on earth? Or are we just hosting through life? Like, okay, I'm just here. And then someday I won't be here again. And that's it. Um, so, you know, almost how they say, you know, on, the, on, on a tombstone, you'd have the, the bet here and then you have the debt here. And there's usually an iPhone in between. And so for me, it's what, what's in that iPhone, you know, for you as an individual, what happened from when you were born and when you, because we're all going to live someday. We just don't know when, you know, but everybody's going to live at some point. So what are you filling that space with? And, and that's it for me. And so when that story came, I said, this, this is no coincidence that this idea is coming to me as a story we need to tell. Yes, it may not be, um, it may not be an entertaining story that you movie that you're going to watch and like, oh, amazing, this is great, you know, um, but there's a lot to learn in the story. And also because um, for the production company, which is Vetview, um, for us, we say that we blend education and entertainment together. So we want people to, you know, come in contact with our production and not be only entertained because entertainment is definitely, you know, something you also want to have as well. But we don't want people to just be entertained. You know, sometimes people watch a movie or you watch a movie and then somebody says, well, have you seen this movie? And you're like, oh yeah, I've seen it. It's a great movie. I liked it. And the person says, what exactly did you like about it? You're like, ah, okay. Thinking about it now, I'm not sure, but I know that I liked it. But we don't want our movies to be like that. We want to be able to tell stories that people enjoy from an entertainment part of view, but also learn a thing or two from it. And so when, when Strain came up as an opportunity, we were going to take it. And so what I'm going to say to people as well is when those opportunities come, when those ideas come, and it can come in anything, it can be you just having an idea to feed people. And then you wake up one day and just make this big pot of rice and you know take it on the streets and just feed the hungry it can be something like that it can be anything it can be you even just driving and see that there's somebody who maybe is disabled and um it's taking the person a longer time to cross the road and you're just there patiently waiting till the person makes it from point a across the road to point b it may just be that but guess what that person is going to spend the rest of that day really feeling like, oh, somebody noticed me right. on the road when I was trying to cross and just waited for me to, you know, go through the road. It can be just something as almost as minute as that. Um, but I think our world can be a better place and will be a better place if we all just live intentionally and, um, and a bit more maybe courageous yeah. to, to leave an impact and make an impact, you know, in whatever it is we find ourselves doing. Well, Tony, that is beautiful. I really have thank you again for taking that risk on people with circle self by shining and putting a big spotlight for us. Thank you, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.